Lot shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 18th of the seventh month on our Creator's calendar as we reckon it, which happens to line up with the 30th of September 2023 on the Gregorian calendar. And we are covering a topic that came up. Um, uh, our sister Katie and brother Michael had questions about the calendar and they were asking specifically about the days of the week, how it lines up and how we can know like the first day of the week was the first day of creation for one. And then I was also trying to show how we can know that the seven day week is still how it's supposed to be in scripture. So we'll backtrack and cover what we we'd already mentioned, but she had a question right now about Exodus chapter 16. And if you, you want to rephrase that or re restate it, and then I can, I can answer, or do you want me to just paraphrase? That's fine. I was saying that um, I have come to the truth from being in the wilderness. And so I'm in the wilderness still, right? So I'm in the wilderness and I'm reading um, Shemoth 1626. Gab, you know, you're gathering the manna six days on the seventh day is the Shabbat and there is none, right? So you're, you're having double portion manna on the sixth day. So my question is on your calendar, I'm looking at day, I'm looking at the first month of the first day, but then on the fourth day, I'm celebrating Shabbat. So it doesn't line up with Exodus 16, um, where it says, you know, we have the first day and then for six days, we collect the manna double portion on the sixth day. And then the seventh day we rest. So how are, how are we, um, you know, having our new moon celebration on day four, uh, of the week, which you're labeling day one, and then Shabbat is day four, when in ex Exodus 16, it says, you know, six days, we collect the manna, double portion on the sixth day, and then the seventh day, we rest. Absolutely. Okay, no problem. So hopefully, everyone will get that question. And I'm sure it's a concern for a lot of people. This was actually gone over before when I was with the congregation of Elohim that Brother Jackson Safant hosts, we had covered this topic and I had gone over it later on. And recently, he also went over this topic again. And I actually think that his version is a little bit better than mine um, because he makes it less confusing as he reads through it. I might have been a little muddled up in how I had presented it. So I, I'll try to share what he had put together just so you can get the narrative from that and how he presented it it was pretty easy but i want to show you i'll, I'll kind of cover it right here and ob willing you'll be able to see that what they mention in exodus 16 or shemot 16 is not inconsistent at all with what we can have right here in the calendar so starting on verse one it says and they set out from elim and all the congregation of the children of Yisrael came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month, or, or Chodesh, if you will. So right here on the 15th day of the second month is when they finished traveling and arrived at the wilderness of Sin. Okay? Okay. And it says, all the children grumbled against Moshe and Aharon in the wilderness. And the children of Yisrael said to them, If only we had died by the hand of Yahuwah in the land of Mitzrayim, when we sat by the pots of meat, and when we ate bread to satisfaction. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to put all this assembly to death with hunger. All foretelling things. And just to confirm your inclination that you had we are in the wilderness literally in in the prophetic or ruachni spiritual sense if you will um typified by the the wilderness journey with the children here with moshe but that was fully culminated with the the woman given wings and leading off into the wilderness for time time and half a times in revelation it's alluded to as the dove fleeing to the wilderness in the Psalms and uh, 
it has a few other references in different parts of the foretellers as the the wilderness which america at its founding when the first explorers were coming over they they called it the great wilderness so it was actually uh foretelling that very fact and this is the place where it was mentioned that he, they would have succor or comfort from affliction for a time and it's also the place where his word will never be taken from us from from our mouths or from our children from that time and forever which is patently true this is the one country in the world where the scriptures have always been available but um back on point in the wilderness here they they arrive on the 15th they grumbled and complained all right and we are on verse four and Yahuwah said to Moshe, See, I am raining bread from the Shamayim for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day in order to try them, whether they walk in my Torah or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moshe and Aharon said to the children of Israel, at evening, you shall know that Yahuwah has brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim. And in the morning, you shall see the esteem of Yahuwah. For he hears your grumblings against Yahuwah. And what are we that you grumble against us? And Moshe said, In that Yahuwah gives you meat to eat in the evening, and in the morning bread to satisfaction. For Yahuwah hears your grumblings which you make against him. And what are we? Your grumblings are not against us, but against Yahuwah. And Moshe said to Aharon, Say to all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before Yahuwah, for he has heard your grumblings. And it came to be, as Aharon spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness and see the esteem of Yahuwah appeared in the cloud. So right here, it says, in the morning, you shall see the esteem of Yahuwah. Okay. That means that it is now the morning of the 16th. And it says, and Yahuwah spoke to Moshe, saying, I have heard the grumblings of the children of Israel speak to them, saying, between the evenings, you are going to, or you are to eat meat. And in the morning you are to be satisfied with bread, and you shall know that I am Yahuwah. And it came to be that quells came up at evening and covered the camp. And in the morning dew lay all around the camp. So right here, on the 16th, which is a Shabbat, there is no work to be done. He didn't give them food today. He gave them meat at evening. And after sunset, they, they were to eat. Between the evenings, they got their food because you don't do work on the Shabbat. You don't you don't start a fire. Although that was given afterwards, I believe. But he's teaching them. So right here, there was no work, but they got meat in the evening. And on the morning, the next day, they got the manna. Everyone following there? Is there any confusion? I'll zoom that in. I'm sorry. It is the second month which is identical to the fifth and the eighth month that is being spoken of here, right there. So just to recap, they finished traveling and came there on the 15th. They grumbled and complained. He said, you were going to be, you, you will know that he's Yahuwah in the evening and in the morning you'll see his esteem, which they saw his esteem in the morning. And he told them in the evening you'll eat meat and in the morning you'll have manna, which he gave them meat in the evening. And this is one of two references that the Sabbath day ends at sunset. The other reference is in the Renewed Covenant, where you have the two emissaries, uh, the uncle of our Mashiach, Kalafis, uh, uh, they call him, I believe, and another of the taught ones walking together from one place to another, a Sabbath day's journey between them, but a great distance from Yerushalayim, and he's walking with them. And after the sun sets and they realize who he is, they go all the way back to Yerushalayim to reveal it to the taught ones, further than a Sabbath day's journey. But they were not rebuked for doing so. 
So this is a second witness to that, that you are not, the prohibitions on what you cannot do during the Sabbath day do not apply at night. But right here, they had the meat at night and then they had the manna in the day. We are currently on verse 14. It says, and lay and a layer of dew went up and see on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance as fine as frost on the ground. And the children of Israel saw and they said to each other, Mana, or what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moshe said to them, eat, or It is the bread which Yahuwah has given you to eat. This is the word which he is, which Yahuwah has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need, an omar for each soul, or nefesh, according to the number of nefeshot, or nef nefeshim, I'd have to look at that, or souls or inner beings, right? Let every man take for those who are in his tent. And the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less, and they measured it by omars. And he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. Each one gathered according to his need. And Moshe said, let no one leave any of it until morning. Okay? And they did not listen to Moshe. So it's the morning of the 18th now. So some of them left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moshe was wroth with them. And they gathered it every morning, each according to his need. And when the sun became hot, it melted. And it came to be on the sixth day, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, the 22nd, sixth day, right? That they gathered twice as much bread, two omars for each one, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moshe, and he said to them, this is what Yahuwah said, tomorrow is a rest, a Shabbat, Kadosh la Yahuwah, or set apart to Yahuwah, that which you bake, bake, and that which you cook, cook, and lay up for yourselves all that is left over, to keep it until morning, until the morning of the 23rd, okay? And they laid it up till morning, as Moshe commanded, and it did not stink, and no worm was in it, showing that by obedience it's preserved, even when by disobedience it wasn't. It's not about the bread or keeping it, it's about following what he said. And it said, and it did not stink, and no worm was in it, and Moshe said, eat it today. That would be the Sabbath day, the 23rd, okay? For today is the Sabbath to Yahuwah. Today you do not find it in the field. Gather it six days, which they did from the 17th, which happens to also be the very day that the flood started, the rains, if you recall, that we're, we just read. So there's a significant portion. He rained down manna for his children when he rained down the flood on the wicked. How cool is that? But so to recap, and this is exactly what you see starting at verse one. They traveled and arrived on the 15th of the second month. And they grumbled. He was told they would see the esteem of Yahuwah that next morning, which they did. And they were told that next morning, the 16th, which is the Sabbath, that they would have meat in the evening and manna the next morning, of which they did for the next six days. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then they stored a double portion and kept it up. And if you just backtrack from here, you can see that the first Sabbath of the year is the fourth day of the week. This is actually one of the proofs, Exodus 16, of this calendar in the scriptures, but a lot of people might not see that. So, Ab willing... That's easier for you guys to see now? Or is there any question about how that was written and played out? Thank you. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Now, the next part. Um, 
Do I have it right here? That's a different one, sorry. Right here, you can see that it says in the second month on the first of the week on its 17th, on that day, all the springs of the great abysses were split and the windows or sluices of the firmament or sky opened and rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. So that very same day, like I said, is when the flood happened as well. That very same day is when Adam and Hua sinned in the garden. If you're not familiar with that, you can find that in the book of Yobelim. But, um, sorry about that. So that was the one part. Now to cover what we mentioned before we were recording, this is going to be somewhat redundant to the people on here. I'm sorry, but for the record, for the recording here, there's other witnesses that confirm the the fact that the calendar starts on the fourth day of the week and the creation account follows the weekly order and also the fact that the weekly Shabbat hasn't been changed, okay? It, it's still the seventh day of the week in reality, if you will, or in truth, which is what reality is. Uh, first witness for that is in the book of Daniel and... Uh, I will find that reference real quick. So if you go to Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, this is speaking of the uh, anti-Mashiach, if you will, or the little horn out of the fourth beast kingdom. Let me open it up a little bit. Yeah. So starting at verse 23, this is talking about what we know to be the Roman Empire, okay? And this is what he said. The fourth beast is the fourth kingdom on earth, which is different from all other kingdoms. And it devours all the earth, tramples it down and crushes it. And the ten horn, that is the Roman Empire, which was the fourth kingdom to take empire status um, as foretold, right? And they're the ones that are foretold to reign until our Mashiach returns. That's never changed. And that is literally something you can see throughout the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Apocrypha and Revelation. But they do everything they can and spend billions of dollars and countless amount of time and energy to hide these things from people today because they would not be so successful in what they're doing if we were really aware of what's going on. But it says, and the ten horns are ten kings from this kingdom. They shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and it is different from the first ones, and it humbles three kings. At the fall of the pagan Roman Empire, when the paganized or when the dispersed Hebrews that were flooding in, known as the Germanic hordes, and sacking that and destroying the pagan Roman Empire, they broke it into a, ten different kingdoms. That ten kingdom uh, Europe that it broke into, basically, in the course of about 300 years, three of those kingdoms were uprooted, the last of them being the Lombard Kingdom of Italy, defeated by Charlemagne of France, who was given the title of the first emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, or the first Reich, if you will. And that was when the temporal power of the little horn the Bishop of Rome was made complete around the 600s AD. About 300 years or so, a little less before then, was when Sixtus III first established by canon law, which is Roman canon law. It's still Justinian code. It's municipal code today. It's what every uh, statute falls under as opposed to the, the common law, which is the Bible. Uh, they established their stuff contrary to the truth anyways and it was the paganized hebrews that adopted catholicism that gave power to the papacy when the three horns were plucked up those were all um, non-catholics if you will the lombard kingdom for example were arians which the catholics believe are heretics because they did not accept the catholic triune three and one 
Trinity doctrine, which was established again by Sixtus III, the 666 of Revelation. But last part here, it says, and it speaks words against the Most High, and it wears out the set-apart ones of the Most High, and it intends or it thinks to change appointed times or times and law, and they are given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. People use this verse to think that they have control and they can change the calendar, but it doesn't say that he will. It says that he intends to or that he thinks to. And these are these are known facts in history that the Ten Commandments were split. They removed the Second Commandment and they split the Tenth. So they would have their Ten. They thought to change the law there, but it doesn't really change it in truth just like the Justinian code or the what was originally the the codes established by Sixtus the third that he put together that led to his being nominated as the bishop of Rome i think I believe he was the 42nd bishop of Rome or the 44th bishop of Rome but he was the third sixtus there and he was like i said foretold because he would do these things he established the abomination of desolation, which was the Christ Mass on December 25th, foreshadowed in Antiochus Epiphans in the, the Maccabees. He established um, the keeping of Lent, the 40 days of weeping for Tammuz, and the literal mark of the beast on the forehead or right hand of those that worship and follow after them, which they, they call Ash Wednesday today. And the... the uh, the adoption of Easter and other things were already kind of established at that point, but they were just amalgamating more and more. And it was literally he he was the one that established it as law punishable by the sword of the Roman government. It was it was put together in the Theodosian Codex first, then re-established in the Justinian Code. And that is literally the municipal code that is the foundation of every municipal code and statute throughout the world today but um they never actually changed the law those are all man-made traditions it doesn't mean anything it doesn't affect the truth whatsoever in the very same way they thought to change the calendar they had already had the julian calendar by the time they became an, an empire power and during the times of the Nicolaitan Catholic Christian religion predominating or dominating in Rome, they established the Gregorian calendar by a Jesuit during the reign of the little horn named Gregory. And that calendar doesn't change the truth either, although they think to. And those are the ones that you have in reality that are foretold in Daniel that we can read in chapter 7. But there is no truth in it that they actually changed anything. As different nations adopted the Gregorian calendar, they had to lose seven days or ten days in, in one of their months as they adopted it. And when you look at all this information, they never change the days of the week. It's never inconsistent with itself. So there is no evidence in scripture or in history that they've actually accomplished physically literally changing the day of the week a second witness for this is in the writings of josephus if you give me just one moment all right sorry about that this is an older post from facebook that i have and it is from 2019 i think it might have been shared before then as well and i this shows some historical records you have at least three different authors two of them secular historians from rome tacitus and another one and then josephus or flavius josephus who's also known as yahusuf who wrote the antiquities of the yahudim and the wars of the yahudim in there they both recount the events that happened during the siege and the fact that the Romans exploited the Yahudim's use of the Sabbath to build their siege mounds and get things prepared while the Yahudim would not be acting as aggressors. 
So this is significant because this was right around the time of our Mashiach, and we have absolutely full historical record of keeping the calendar, the reckonings of the what's changed and how things have shifted for their system that entire time. And you can see there's no change of the days of the week, which is the point. Okay. Now it says our creator's calendar is unchanging and unchanged by man. Rome uses their own twisted way to reckon time, but they cannot make a day longer or shorter, change the day of the week, or make a year longer or shorter in reality, nor anything of like nature. They can lie, and we can all fall for it, but truth endures forever. And the truth is in Yahushua, who is the Word. Right. That said, here is one witness that, actually it's three witnesses, or it could be the two, but it says this is one witness, meaning historical resources as one witness, okay? Multiple showing the same fact. It says this is one witness of what day the Shabbat is on. A second witness would be the name of the seventh day in most languages of the world. And a third is the calendar information from the DSS. And the fourth is what we just went over, like in the, the scriptures. If you read the account in, in uh, Shemot 16, it literally lines up with this calendar. There's quite a few places in scripture that you can do that very thing with, but that's one of the first. And it's you can also backtrack that and count and determine that the first day of the year is the fourth day of the week because the 16th is a Shabbat, the 16th of the seventh month, right? This is another witness is in here in Josephus or Yahusuf's Antiquities of the Yahudim, book 14, chapter 4, sections 2 and 3. It says, Now there was a sedition of the men that were within the city who did not agree what was to be done in their present circumstances, while some thought it best to deliver up the city to Pompeii, but Astrobolus's party. Just for context here, this is not the destruction of the city at 70 AD. That also happened there, but this is when Pompeii attacked it. Pompeii was part of the trium the triumvune, the three ruling men over Rome before uh, it was Pompeii. Julius Caesar and uh, Marcus Anthony. They were the three uh, uh, nominated by the Senate to rule in conjunction, right? But um, through infighting and different things, Julius Caesar came to prominence alone and took dictatorship and then became emperor, claimed to be a mighty one history from there, right? And just for the record, the reign of Julius Caesar over the Roman people as emperor was the beginning of the reign that is mentioned of the fourth beast of the three-headed eagle in fourth Ezra, just for the connection there. The second, the longest reigning feather lines up with the longest reigning Caesar in history, which was Augustus. But it says, to deliver up the city to Pompeii, it was Astrobolus and his brother, that were fighting over who would be predominant in the kingdom in, in the uh, kahuna. And because of the infighting and the wickedness of the people, their enemies were going to have subjection over them. And they were becoming, um, they were losing their liberties, just like we are today for violating his covenant that we made with them and keeping the abomination of desolation or Christmas as an official holiday in our country since 1845, which is uh, supposed to be predicated on liberty of conscience above all things. But it says, but Astrobolus's party exhorted them to shut the gates because he was kept in prison. Now these prevented the others and seized upon the temple and cut off the bridge which reached from it to the city and prepared themselves to abide a siege. But the others admitted Pompey's army in and delivered up both the city and the king's palace to him. So Pompey sent his lieutenant Piso with an army and placed garrisons both in the city and in the palace to secure them and fortified the houses that joined to the temple. And all those which were more distant and without it, 
and in the first place he offered terms of accommodation, just like the Yisraeli were supposed to do for all the people that they were going to, right? Sue for peace and have them uh, not have to fight first. But when they would not comply with that, with what was desired, he encompassed all the places thereabout with a wall, wherein Harkanus did gladly assist him on all occasions. But Pompey pitched his camp within, on the north part of the temple, where it was most practical. But even on that side there was great towers, and a ditch had been dug, and a deep valley begirt it round about. For on the parts towards the city were precipices, and the bridge on which Pompey had gotten in was broken down. However, a bank was raised day by day with a great deal of labor, while the Romans cut down materials for it from the places round about. And when its bank was sufficiently raised and the ditch filled up, though but poorly, by reason of its immense depth, he brought in or he brought his mechanical engines and battering rams from Tyre. And placing them on the bank, he battered the temple with the stones that were thrown against it. And had it not been our practice from the days of our forefathers to rest on the seventh day, this bank could never have been perfected. By reason of the opposition in the Yahudim would have made, for though our law gives us leave then to defend ourselves against those that began to fight with us, and assault us, you won't find anywhere in the law where that is given until you read what happens to them in the Maccabees, where the righteous remnant that fled to go into the wilderness to keep the law that they can't keep in the cities and the land were persecuted. And over, I think, a thousand of them were killed on the Sabbath because they would not fight. The rest of them resolved that they could not just lay down to the slaughter if they wanted to preserve their seed. They had to defend themselves, and it was laid down that you could defend yourself, preserve life, but not be an aggressor. It says, yet does it not permit us to meddle with our, and that very fact that you can be, you can fight wars of non-aggression and defend yourself is what our forefathers in this country stood on as a foundational, a foundational law a principle established from scripture that they lived out in Lexington and Concord, where they stood the line and refused to, to bow down, but they would not fire until fired upon. Um, that's another thing that you can see from that John Quaid in that video. If anyone's interested, you can go to the YouTube channel that these videos are under. If you go to the playlists and you go to the things not as they seem, it's the 10th video. He talks about that as well as some other facets of uh, history that we're not aware of. And he shows unequivocally without any, any doubt that the law of our nation is the Bible always was meant to be everything in our government was meant to function under the principles of scripture. And all of our founders knew that they've, they've declared it. They plainly wrote about it and spoke about it. And if we would just read what they said, we'd really know instead of listening to what modern people do, blaspheming and maligning their, the history behind them. But they very plainly said that this nation, America, was only ever made for a righteous and pious people, and it is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. That's John Adams. Again, as the, the virtue of a people diminish, they will, of their own self, without threat of another, succumb to tyranny and loss of freedom <clears throat> but back on track here it says yet it does not permit us to meddle with our enemies while they do anything else which thing when the romans understood on those days which we call sabbaths they threw nothing at the yahudim nor came to any pitched battle with them but raised up their earthen banks and brought their engines into such forwardness that they might do execution the next day. And any one may hence learn how very great 
piety we exercise towards Elohim and the observation of his laws, since the Kohanim were not at all hindered from their set-apart ministrations by their fear during the siege, but did still twice a day in the morning and about the ninth hour, off the third hour and the ninth hour, right? Offer their sacrifices on the altar, nor did they omit those sacrifices if any melancholy accident happened by the stones that were thrown among them. For although the city was taken on the third month, on the day of the fast, upon the 179th Olympiad, when Caius Antonius and Marcus Tullius Cicero were consuls, he gives you the day, the month and day in the reckoning, and also the years is reckoned by the, the calendar that you can keep track of, okay? That way we can still know when this was supposed to be done. It says, and, on, and the enemy then fell upon them and cut the throats of those that were in the temple, yet could not those that offered the sacrifices be compelled to run away, neither by the fear they were in of their own lives, nor by the number that were already slain, as thinking it better to suffer whatever came upon them at their very altars than to omit anything that their laws required of them. If only we would have that kind of steadfast fidelity. And that this is not a mere brag or an ecumen to manifest a, deg a degree of our piety that is that was false, but is the real truth. I appeal to those that have written of the Acts of Pompeii and among them of Strabo and Nicolaus of Damascus, so there's two, and then you also have um, Tacitus, which is another one, right? And besides these two, Titus Livius, the writer of the Roman history, who will bear witness to this thing. And then right here is another one confirming that. This is from Cassius de Romeo History. Okay. It says, most, or the setting is 63 BCE or BC before Mashiach, right? Most of the city, to be sure, he took without any trouble, because they let him in, as we just read, as he was received by the party of Harkanus. But the temple itself, which the other party had occupied, he captured only with difficulty, for it was on high ground and was fortified by a wall of its own. And if they had continued defending it on all days alike, he could not have gotten possession of it. As it was, they made an excavation of what they called the days of Saturn, and by doing no work at all on those days afforded the Romans an opportunity in this interval to batter down the wall. The latter, on learning of this superstitious awe of theirs, made no serious attempts the rest of the time, but on those days when they came round in succession, assaulted most vigorously. Thus the defenders were captured on the day of Saturn without making any defense, and all the wealth was plundered. The kingdom was given to Harkanus, and Astrobolus was carried away. Later on, Astrobolus would be brought back by the Parthians, or Ephraim, and established. He would cut off the ears of his brother, and Rome would later come back and reestablish themselves as the dictators, give the kingdom... Um, to Herod after that time. And Harkanus would have been dishonored, but that was when they had lost the government of the people because there was infighting amongst them. The point here is you can see that Saturn is called the Shabbat, right? There's another account of this at the fall of uh, the the city and Hekel in 70 AD and what they record in his secular records at that time as well. So that was one, two, and I think we have one more to show if you give me just one moment. All right, so it was asked that we, it's important that we see how we can determine how to start a year without looking at a, a a Gregorian calendar or trying to use that to determine when we start. So I'm going to show real quick two witnesses. And here's the first one. This is from 
Yobelim chapter 2, verse 7 through 12, right? This is also from the Dead Sea Scrolls 4Q216, column 6. And it we're going to really start after line 5, okay? This is on the fourth day, Yahuwah made the sun, the moon, and the stars. He placed them in the, the firmament or the vault of the sky, the rakia, right? So that they could give light to the whole earth to regulate day and night and to separate light and darkness. And he placed the sun as a great sign above the earth for the days, the Sabbaths, the months, the feasts, the years, the weeks of years, and the Yobelim, or Jubilees, and for all the cycles of the years. It, the sun, separates light from darkness and is the vitality by which everything that sprouts and grows in the earth prospers. Right? And you can feel that anytime you have the sun hit you in the face, it invigorates you. But you see here, the light of the world given all authority. Or I mean the sun, you know, the picture of the bridegroom having authority over when the light begins and ends, separates days, feasts, years, everything is done by the sun. So, and the sun was created the fourth day. That's one witness that you actually start on the fourth day. We'll read another where it directly tells you that in just a moment. But uh, that goes directly in line with the creation account when the sun was made on the fourth day. And with like what we just read in Exodus or Shemot chapter 16, when you look at the account and you line it up with the calendar, when they were traveling on the 15th, they got the meat in the evening on the 16th. The man is beginning on the 17th. If you back that calendar up, the first day of the year is on the fourth day of the week. So that is a witness of itself as well. And then if you give me one moment, we'll find the other one real quick for three of them. All right, now here's another reference. And this one's talking about the beginning of the month, the beginning of the year and how it lines up with um in relation excuse me to the moon okay but it says it's light on the fourth day of the week right and it breaks it says the creation it's talking about how that was when it was created both the sun and the moon right in the fourth day gamal the sign of Shekinah in the fourth year, the sign of Gamal in the year of release, the sign of Shekinah in the third year, the sign of Gamal in the sixth. Now, and it goes through Shekinah and Gamal. This is the, the scroll I was telling you about that goes through the 294-year period where it's mentioned right here. Gamal in the first, Shekinah in the fourth, Gamal in the rest year. Uh, willing you see that Shekinah the third of the second Gamal the sixth year and this is the list that it's going through for this entire 294 year period okay you have uh, this week of years one two three four five six seven so this is a Yobelim or 49 years right and you have one two three four five six of them and then they repeat themselves because this ends with number 21 in the order and that that begins with gamal number 22 so that's what this is going over just so you have context there but you can see it starts with gamal on the fourth day as that sign with the full moon because that's how the light was at the beginning of creation on the fourth day of the week so there's multiple witnesses, Father willing. You can see the day of the week lining up with the creation account, lining up with the calendar for when these things are supposed to be. That's outside of the fact that you have the history in the narrative of Scripture lining up, and that's not just with Exodus or Shemot 16, but you have like Yahukanon, the account of our Mashiach during the Pesach, 
and the unleavened bread in the eight days they wait to show Toma in the evening and letting him touch him because that's after first fruits. It all lines up with this calendar. The flood account in the Dead Sea Scrolls lines up with this calendar. It, it's the same pattern, right? That's just another witness to show that the days of the week line up with the days of creation, which lines up with the calendar. And quite literally, it is the truth and how it was meant to be presented. So, ob willing, those are um, those are edifying and something at least that we can think about. You don't have to just believe, but it, you can dig in more, certainly. And the more you look, the more you can see it literally lines up. Everything you can read in the narratives there, you should be able to find right here on this calendar. So thank you all for your time. Um, is there any comments or questions about what we covered? so we can get on the record if, in case other people might have it too if there's anything that's still confusing all right well i suppose not and um we will Talk to you all next week. You have a wonderful Shabbat and a Shavua Tova, a, a good week ahead. Thank you for your time. Y'all who will be with you all.